of the hour. What's the weather like where you are? We are coming on the air with millions getting ready for their first big freeze of the season. Bracing for cold, snow, rain, all of it as a powerful winter storm gets ready to slam the Northeast. What you need to know and will you need to break out the shovel? Then the stunning resignation of the pro-gun movement's decades-long leader, why Wayne LaPierre chose today to step down from the NRA. New jobs numbers out today. Great if you're looking for work. A mixed bag, really, if you're hoping interest rates will be cut anytime soon. We're going to break down what it means for you and your wallet. And could weight loss drugs cause suicidal thoughts? The new study that shows some drugs carry a greater risk than others. And then the father of Casey Anthony taking a lie detector test over his alleged role in his granddaughter's disappearance, what the results could mean for the now 16-year disappearance. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halley. More than 30 million people are under winter alerts today as the Northeast braces for the first big winter storm of the season. It's already hitting the plains. Take a look live right now at Wichita, Kansas. Look at the white snow there, already there in the, in the, uh, in the Kansas plains. It's moving through the middle of the country and Texas before it heads east and then up the coast, where it looks like it could be the biggest snowstorm to hit in nearly two years. Snow, rain, ice, and heavy winds. Folks are already getting ready with salt for roads and sidewalks, shovels and snow plows. Boston looking at six inches and Massachusetts says it's ready. It's a year-long kind of planning effort. We, as soon as the last snowfall ends, our guys really start looking at what can we do better next year, and so we're ready to go. All right, well, here in D.C. and a lot of cities in the Mid-Atlantic, we may just end up with a big batch of rain. It would not be much of a surprise. D.C. has gone 17, make that 719 days without a single day of at least a inch of snow. Philadelphia, it's been 705 days. New York, 690. So we're all going to be watching this very closely. However, keep those snow boots and umbrellas out and ready because after this storm, there's another pretty powerful storm also headed our way early next week. We have meteorologist Bill Karen standing by with a forecast. But first, George Solis is in New Jersey. George, you're outside a Home Depot right now. Are people right now moving into the store and then stocking up on the supplies they haven't needed in, in years, really? That's right. It's been sort of a dry run for what has been a snow drought. So earlier today, yeah, there were some long lines here at the Home Depot, people packing up the snow melt, the snow shovels, the snow scrapers, basically everything they would need to survive this incoming snowstorm. But as you mentioned, we're looking at more of a rain event here than the snow, but people still eager to make sure they have those supplies as that second round of severe weather moves this way. So yes, unfortunately, we may not get the winter wonderland as some of those images that we saw uh, in, in Kansas us earlier, but still people anticipating a little bit of snow. Obviously, Boston, mid-Atlantic regions and further inland upstate, you're going to see a little bit more snow. So those people obviously taking those precautions. People here not taking any chances, though. They're saying, look, we don't miss shoveling the snow, or at least some do. But nevertheless, they want to have their supplies. They want to make sure they have everything ready to go, especially those snowblowers. We know they sit idle for a while. They can stall. They may not work. So they're getting them geared up, ready to go. And again, here's what some people at the Home Depot told us earlier today about this incoming storm. I was thinking getting ready. You know, this is our first uh, year to shovel our own home. So I'm just getting prepared. I've lived here all my life, so if it did us know another day, it would be great. I'm content with whatever nature comes or brings. And right now, again, looking like a little bit more rain, at least here in the New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia area. But still, again, if you're li liking some snow, we may get a second chance when that second system rolls around next week, Tom. Yeah, note to self, I need to fuel up my uh, snowblower just in case. You know, you make a good point, because even if we don't get a lot of snow on this one, that doesn't mean that we couldn't have really slick roads, icing conditions, power outages, right? 
Yeah, and some of the images that we've been seeing obviously tell the story, right? You don't necessarily need six inches of snow on the ground for it to be a problem. When you have the cold weather and those slick conditions, it can definitely cause an issue on the roadways. Trucks jackknifing, some pileups. You can also have some power outages with that snowfall. So that's something that a lot of officials and state agencies are gearing up for and prepared for for this round. Again, consider it a dry run for what it may be coming. Nevertheless, all these agencies, the warnings are in place, the crews are in place. We're all just waiting to see what this system does to know how to prepare because again it has been a while since we've seen any significant snowfall but nevertheless we want to make sure that we're ready for whatever mother nature throws our way tom you know if they're watching us from canada they're saying you guys are wimps with a big capital <laughs> w uh george thank you very and much oh, in tow. <laughs> that's true let's bring in meteorologist bill karens so bill uh give us the update now where is this storm going to boom and where is it going to bust of the local folks here in dc say it's going to bust it's going to be rain here yeah i-95 this is just not the storm for you and as you showed in that graphic that shouldn't be a big surprise for anyone the ocean's very warm there's not a lot of ton of cold air out ahead of this storm so this snow is going to fall where you think it should mostly in New England and the mountains of the Appalachians. So that's where we have all of our warnings here that are now being converted. It still can watch us in northern New England. And over the last, I'd say, 24, 36 hours, the heavier snow continues to shift further north, away from the coastal areas, away from the I-95 corridor. We're worried about ice in areas of Virginia. And then this will be all snow, central Pennsylvania up here through central New York, and then into southern and also central New England. So here's the snowfall map, how much snow is going to fall. I haven't completely said zero for Philly and D.C. and New York. I don't want to break all the kids' hearts until it's too late, until it's over with. But, you know, zero to one inch. Don't expect anything on the pavement or the grass. And by the way, the National Weather Service is still saying they think in Central Park on the grass, they could be one to two inches. Now, the pavement, zero chance. The temperature in New York's never going to drop below 34 degrees during the storm. So, it'll, you know, rain boots will be just fine for everyone else. Once you get into the interior, that's where we'll get enough snow for plowing. Notice, we're, you know, these aren't blockbuster totals for these cities. I mean, this is kind of a minor event, typically, but it hasn't really snowed. So, that first time driving and getting used to it uh, is what always gets people. So here's the timing of everything. Here's where the storm is now. A lot of heavy rain in the southeast tonight. And then, as we go through tomorrow morning, this is at 5 a.m. This is freezing rain. The mountains of North Carolina. Carolina, Asheville to Boone, and up here near Roanoke, western portions of Virginia. A little bit of light snow in southern portions of the Ohio Valley. It's not going to accumulate much. So Washington, D.C., maybe a little bit of snow and sleet at the start of this thing early, but then it quickly goes over to rain, and that's just going to be the rest of the storm. Same goes for Philadelphia, maybe around noon to 4, and then uh, about 4 p.m. or so over to all rain. New York City, it looks like about midday, we'll start to see some precipitation. May start as a little snow, then over to rain for the evening and heavy at times. So, Tom, only Boston will be all snow for this event, especially away from the coast. Uh, could be a decent dose of snow, especially around that 495 loop. Okay, give us the update now for the next storm that's coming, because yeah. that's coming next week, right? Yeah, and if you're not paying attention this weekend, this one will catch a lot of people by surprise Monday, Tuesday. So here's the storm. We're starting it on Saturday on the West Coast. Then it dives down into the Four Corner region by the time we get into Sunday. By the time we get into Monday, it heads into the plains, and this is where it really strengthens. It gets to be a very strong storm. It's going to have incredible wind gusts all around this uh, system, out of the south or on the backside out of the north. We could have blizzard conditions developing as we go throughout Monday evening into Tuesday morning. There's a chance for blizzard conditions not far from St. Louis and Chicago, especially just north side of those areas. And then on the east coast with this, first off, we're going to have a chance of severe weather Monday, Tuesday, down along the Gulf Coast and Florida. And then this heavy rain shield heads into these areas that are getting this storm. So people in southern New England, Tom, they could possibly have, you know, six to ten inches of snow, then two inches of rain. That's all going to melt. I mean, incredible flood risk, too, in the northeast Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday. This is going to be a big disaster in a lot of areas. Okay, we'll be watching it, and I suspect uh, riding it out. Bill, thank you very much. Uh, we have some breaking news just into us right now in the last couple of minutes. The Supreme Court is agreeing to weigh whether former President Donald Trump can be kicked off the ballot in Colorado as the Colorado Supreme Court has ruled. And as you know, that, that ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court was put on hold while this was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Danny Savalos is joining us now to give us the breakdown. Danny, I understand that they're going to hear it on February 8th, which is the same day as the Nevada caucus. 
Yes, exactly. And the issue here is that even though the Supreme Court may be taking up this Colorado case, they may decide a universal issue such as whether or not Donald Trump is an officer within the meaning of Section 3, which was a big issue in Colorado. But all these other states, it doesn't necessarily dispose of those other states unless and until, arguably, those states uh, have a petition before the court. So this may end up being a piecemeal process if the only case the court this hearing is the one in Colorado. Oh, okay. Now, Danny, I'm just reading through this uh, on my laptop as we talk here. We've got the main challenge as well, uh, which is the most immediate other challenge that's gone all the way to the main secretary of state. Exactly right. And look at this is a great example of how different these cases are, even though they seem so similar. In Colorado, the two major issues were, was Donald Trump an insurrectionist and was he an officer within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Similar issues in Maine. But in Maine, they went through the administrative process, through the Secretary of State. In Colorado, they went through the courts. What a huge difference. And actually, legally, they could have gone through the Secretary of State in Colorado. And now in Maine, it may go through the court. But what if, for example, uh, a court determines that this is what's called a non-justiciable question, something the courts can't hear at all? Then you have a situation where Colorado, uh, that decision may be null and void. And meanwhile, the administratively decided one in Maine could be legitimate. The point is, this is becoming very quickly a patchwork quilt of different decisions yeah. on the issue of whether Donald Trump can remain on the ballot. And importantly, the Colorado decision is based on the 14th Amendment. The, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled, that, in fact, ruled in contrary to what the appeals court in Colorado had already said. The Colorado Supreme Court said, sorry, the 14th Amendment does not allow somebody who engaged in an insurrection to actually be on the ballot for president. It seems to me one challenge, according to many legal scholars, is he's not been convicted of being involved in an insurrection. That is the weakest argument, in my opinion, for the Trump team, because when you look at the language of the Constitution, which often suffers from being a little too general and a little too vague and written in old fashioned language. But when you look at the language of the 14th Amendment, it doesn't anywhere require a conviction for insurrection. And I think most leading scholars would agree. I think there's almost universal agreement on this, except for maybe on the Trump side, uh, that you don't need to be convicted of insurrection. That insurrection determination is kind of left open. So I to be a conviction, but what it has to be, how it's determined, that part is a little unclear. And I'm also noting here that now there's talk in Texas of a retaliatory move from the lieutenant governor of kicking Biden off of the ballot in Texas. Yes, and that, of course, is always the risk with these kinds of political judicial maneuvers, is that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it should be no surprise that Republicans will start trying to do the same thing. But they're not going to have uh, as easy a path because there is the insurrection clause in the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. You have a pretty good uh, set of facts when you look at January 6th. Uh, real quickly, is this a quick turnaround uh, in terms of what we expect from the Supreme Court? Do you expect a decision quickly? And are you surprised that they've come out and said they will take the case as quickly as they did? I'm not surprised that they're taking it. It was a near certainty that they would take it and not surprised that they did so quickly. Uh, we're often asked, legal analysts like me, how soon, what's the timeline? And for most of these cases, we have only our own cases of people involving people that no one's ever heard of. Uh, and so the timelines we're used to are weeks and months. But yeah. when it is such a critical constitutional issue like this, it really isn't a surprise that the Supreme Court would stop what they're doing and focus on a decision like this with such monumental, earth-shattering implications. It's no surprise they move at breakneck speed for these cases. But for your run-of-the-mill case involving some guy you've never heard of, don't expect this kind of treatment. All right, Danny, thank you very much. Uh, let's quickly go now to NBC's Von Hilliard, who's on the campaign trail. He's in Iowa, where President Trump is campaigning uh, this evening. Uh, and I guess, Von, it's too early to have any sort of immediate reaction from the crowd behind you, but it's pretty clear what the Trump campaign has felt about the Colorado and the Maine decisions to take him off the ballot. 
Exactly, Tom. And all this is running perpendicular to the political. The day of those ar oral arguments on February 8th is the day of the Nevada caucus. Of course, it's the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary, and then the Nevada caucus. And this year, the, the timeline that the Supreme Court is working on allows them to make a ruling potentially early enough if they were to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court's decision disqualifying him from a ballot that would still leave the great share of the Republican electorate around the country to select a different candidate for president of the United States. Just two weeks after that is the South Carolina primary. Obviously, the stakes of this are high. And I'll, I'll let our legal team get into the specifics. But Donald Trump is landing, as we speak right now, into Iowa for two days of campaign rallies. We are in rural Sioux Center, Iowa. Of course, we're going to talk to the campaign team. We could very well expect Donald Trump to take this head on when he gets on stage. Donald Trump, to be clear, uh, well, a great many legal experts expect the Supreme Court to leave him on the ballot. Donald Trump is concerned about this uh, decision in front of the Supreme Court. His own attorney, Alina Haba, said just that two days ago in suggesting his fear is based on the own Supreme Court justices that he nominated uh, and that were uh, appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, three of them during his four years in office, Tom. And he fears that, uh, in the words of Alina Haba, his attorney, that they could try to appear neutral by ruling against him. It was just one year ago, in fact, he put out on a social media post that the Supreme Court always rules against him. Of course, that's not always the case, but on that particular ruling in 2022, they forced him to turn over his tax returns to a congressional House committee that subpoenaed them. So for Donald Trump, there is a lot at stake. The future of his presidential campaign is at stake, and we are just uh, about 10 days away from the Iowa caucus right now. And of course, voters say that they're going to stick with him no matter what, uh, but it's hard to ignore the fact that the Supreme Court is going to be making the determination, more likely than not, whether he's going to be a presidential candidate in 2024, Tom. You know, you made such a good point there, Vaughn, real quickly. Let me let you expand on it. His, he has grown his base with, the, with these uh, challenges to his candidacy, with the Colorado decision, with the Maine decision. Um, the question is whether uh, what's happening in the middle, what's happening with independence in this country as this campaign progresses? Right. That is the that is the issue here. And honestly, when you look at the polling between Iowa and New Hampshire, Tom, you see Nikki Haley performing much better in the state of New Hampshire, because in New Hampshire, they allow independent voters to go and take part in the Republican primary process. Here in Iowa, you have to be a registered Republican. And Iowa polling shows him about a 30 point lead. And in New yeah. Hampshire, polling has Nikki Haley down anywhere from four points to 10 points. So it's much smaller deficit because we see that independent voters, they're looking for somebody not named Donald Trump. They're looking for somebody not named Joe Biden. But right now, if the Republican electorate has their say, he's winning and polling in every single state. And so, you know, that's where you've seen the RFK Jr. trying to get on the ballot as an independent candidate. This group, No Labels, is trying to create a potential bipartisan presidential ticket uh, to try to cater more toward the middle of the country, people that are uh, dissatisfied with both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Yeah. Uh, Vaughn, you've got an interesting and a long night ahead of you. Thank you very much. Let's get back to Danny real quickly. Thanks, you know, Danny, I've listened to uh, conservative commentators on this uh, who come down on both sides of this issue. Some say that they expect the Supreme Court will reaffirm the Colorado decision, and others say the Colorado decision doesn't have a chance in heck of, of, of being uh, supported. What, what is your takeaway? I think the takeaway is to look at this as playing the odds. So no matter what side you're on, you look at all the different, I guess you can call them opportunities, but you can look at switches that have to be aligned for Donald Trump uh, to be kicked off the ballot. And for example, take a look at the Colorado original district court, the trial court. It concluded that Donald Trump was an insurrectionist after an evidentiary hearing. But even though he was an insurrectionist, it also concluded that he was not an officer within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Therefore, he wasn't covered. Therefore, he would remain on the ballot. Then it goes to the Colorado Supreme Court. They're sharply divided 4-3. So that was a close call. But so many things need to line up for Donald Trump to remain off the ballot. The failure of any one of them and Donald Trump remains on the ballot. For example, we talked about whether or not the courts can even hear this issue or yeah. whether it's really committed to another branch, to an administrative branch. Maybe Maine got it right by doing it administratively. 
So that's an issue as well. There may be several other reasons why a court, the Supreme Court in particular, can conclude that Donald Trump stays on. Everything needs to line up perfectly uh, for those who want to kick him off the ballot for him to remain off the ballot. So if you're just placing a bet, the odds are going to be in favor of Donald Trump staying on the ballot. If for no other reason, then a lot of almost everything, all these issues have to line up perfectly for him to remain off the ballot. Any one of them failing, he remains on the ballot. Uh, Danny, great expertise. Thank you very much. And Von Hilliard, thank you very much. Other news now. We are learning the high school principal in Perry, Iowa, tried to calm down and distract the shooter during that school shooting yesterday that killed a sixth grader and wounded five others. The principal's actions could have saved lives. Police say the shooter was a 17-year-old student. He died by suicide after the shooting. School principal Dan Marburger was among the injured. His daughter shared a post on Facebook about her death dad, describing how he tried to distract the shooter long enough for students to get out of the cafeteria. Quote, that's just dad, she says. He is now in stable condition. The community still seeking answers about the shooter's motives and how a 17-year-old got access to the weapons he used. We bring in now Adrian Broadus, who's in Perry, Iowa. Uh, this story of the school principal is pretty remarkable, and I'm just wondering what else you're learning. Uh, specifically, I understand that there's a press conference scheduled in the next 10 minutes or so. Yes, it's happening just a few blocks away from the high school. And Tom, I can tell you, teachers returning to the school for the first time since yesterday's shooting called their principal remarkable and incredible. And you just named him moments ago. His name is Dan Marburger. In that heartfelt post from his daughter, she said she wasn't surprised when she learned her father, and I'm paraphrasing here, essentially put himself in harm's way in order to allow other students to escape the cafeteria. I spoke with a student at last night's vigil who says Mr. Marburger is who she would go to during difficult moments. She would seek him out for counsel. He was like a family to me when I was in school because he was, when I would go and talk to him, he would listen and everything. You shared your secrets with him? Yeah. Everything that happened to me, I would always tell him. And we heard that from other students saying whenever this community was grieving, he was the one who would encourage them and bring the community together. Now this community is leaning on each other. I want to point out at this hour, we do not have the names of the other four students who were injured from investigators. Hopefully we will get that information in the next eight minutes during that news conference. The names we have received and information we've learned about that sixth grader who was all also killed. We've heard yeah. from teachers, students, and other faculty, Tom. Okay, Adrian, we're going to check back with you at the top of the hour for an update. Thank you very much, Adrian, who's there in Perry, Iowa, for us. Now to breaking news on the National Rifle Association, the NRA, the juggernaut gun rights lobbying group. In just the last few hours, Wayne LaPierre has announced he is resigning. After more than 30 years leading the NRA, he cites health reasons. And that's big, because for years, LaPierre has been the face of the pro-gun movement and among the most influential conservative voices in the country. But the timing of this resignation is interesting because just days from now, LaPierre is set to face a civil trial in New York City. New York Attorney General Letitia James alleging that during his reign, LaPierre misspent millions in NRA funds on things like personal vacations and expensive designer clothes. A.G. James reacted to the news today on X, writing in part, LaPierre's resignation validates our claims against him, but it will not insulate him from accountability. We look forward to presenting our case in court. NBC's Kendall Lanian picks up the story. It was once one of the most powerful political organizations in America, harnessing the voices of major celebrities. From my cold, dead hands. And striking fear in the hearts of elected officials. Gun-hating politicians should never go to bed unafraid of what this association and all of our millions of members can do to their political careers. But after decades of wielding outsized influence over the issue of gun control, 
the National Rifle Association is now facing the biggest crisis in its history, with membership and fundraising in steep decline. The man at the helm of the NRA for more than three decades, Wayne LaPierre, announcing he'll step down effective January 31st, citing health reasons. It comes just as the civil corruption trial is set to begin. New York's Attorney General Letitia James is suing, alleging LaPierre and others misspent the group's money on inflated pay, luxury travel, and designer suits. They use millions upon millions of dollars from the NRA for personal use, including for lavish trips for themselves and their families. The case alleges LaPierre billed the NRA over a half million dollars for eight family private jet trips to the Bahamas. Leaked internal documents posted on the Internet and reported by the Wall Street Journal show he billed another $40,000 for a single shopping trip to a Zania boutique in Beverly Hills. A judge denied the AG's bid to dissolve the NRA entirely, so any money recovered would flow back to the group, which says it has cleaned up its financial affairs. Both the NRA and LaPierre did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. But LaPierre said in a 2020 statement that the AG's investigation is an affront to democracy and freedom, calling it an unconstitutional premeditated attack aiming to destroy the NRA. The NRA has got to go! Hey, hey. James, a Democrat vocal in America's partisan gun debate. Tell those cowardly Congress members, members of the GOP, that you'll feel the pressure. You'll feel the pressure. The legal fight and bad publicity have apparently hurt the NRA. For a very long time, the NRA was the single loudest voice on gun policy in the country. Nobody sees the NRA as some invincible juggernaut anymore. Instead, it's an organization who you might not want to be uh, associated with too much in public. According to the New York Times, membership has shrunk to just over 4 million, down from what the NRA reported was 6 million five years ago. And membership dues down, too, by $14 million from 2021 to 2022, according to an audit filed as part of the suit. It all comes on the heels of growing troubles for the organization. Text reject. R-E-J. Outrage following mass shootings led to a series of celebrity campaigns to reject the NRA. Hi, my name is Jack Antonoff. Cheryl Crow. Melissa McCarthy. Anna DeVere Smith. Adam Scott. And more criticism after then-spokesperson Dana Lash accused the media of loving mass shootings. Crying white mothers are ratings gold. The NRA soon finding itself the target of a boycott, with major companies including Delta, MetLife, and Hertz cutting ties. But the NRA's decline hasn't changed the politics of gun control, as mass shootings continue to rock communities across the country. Active shooter incidents, all available units to listen. I've never been so scared in my life. Major gun restrictions, such as a ban on assault weapons, have proven impossible to enact. While an American's right to bear arms almost without restriction has become Republican Party gospel. I was proud to be the most pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment president you've ever had. Now, as the NRA trial looms, onlookers wondering if it will galvanize support or mark the beginning of a new chapter in America's gun debate. Ken Delanian, NBC News, Washington. All right, well, we have stapled uh, Danny to the chair. So, Danny, now we go to the next topic of the day and the NRA. Uh, can it efficiently, effectively rather, distance itself from LaPierre now that he's out? And does his resignation indicate anything about the legal jeopardy that he could be in and that, in fact, the uh, organization recognizes it's been in in terms of its finances? Well, understanding a bit of the history here, originally Letitia James sought not only to get LaPierre and others out of their supervisor, their official roles within the NRA, she also sought to dissolve the NRA. A judge denied that bid and instead allowed the claims to proceed forward and seek restitution. Not restitution to the attorney general or the state of New York, but restitution back to the organization itself. So while the attorney general originally wanted to dissolve the NRA, completely, the court made her settle for getting rid of LaPierre. That has now happened. So a major goal of the lawsuit has been achieved. To the extent that LaPierre may face additional liability, that remains to be seen. But you have to imagine that law enforcement, if they were interested in him for any reason based on the private jets and the shopping sprees, they likely would have indicted him already. However, 
anything is possible. Investigations often take a long time. So who knows? But in terms of legal jeopardy, LaPierre was already in legal jeopardy in this case as one of the people targeted by Letitia James. Yeah. Uh, okay, don't go anywhere. Something's going to break in a few minutes. We're sure of it. Uh, Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Back soon. Let's take you now overseas, where right now, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on a diplomatic tour of the Middle East, trying to tamp down rising tensions in the region as top Israeli leaders are now publishing plans for what could be next in the war and then what comes after. Uh, that includes a proposal that neither Israel, Israel nor Hamas would be in control of Gaza after the war. Those top Israeli leaders say local, non-hostile actors would govern the Strip. According to their plan, the United States would lead a multinational task force to rebuild Gaza. What precisely that will look like isn't at all clear. For now, Israel says the next phase of the war will involve raids and special operations in northern Gaza and a focus on eliminating Hamas leadership in the south. As we're learning more about the absolute devastation for civilians in the Strip, with the U.N. revealing cases of diarrhea for young children up 50 percent in one week, 90 percent of babies under two now facing severe food poverty. Let's go now to Raf San Raf Sanchez, who is in Tel Aviv for us. And Raf, th those are really startling numbers. As you know, babies get dehydrated in a heartbeat. Uh, what more do we know about Israel's new plan for Gaza? And importantly, what could it mean for the people who live there? Well, Tom, is very interesting. Just one day before Secretary of State Blinken arrived back here in the Middle East, Israel starting to lay out a vision for Gaza post Hamas. As you said, there are a number of components here. They are looking for the U.S. and for wealthy Arab states to pay for the reconstruction of the frankly devastated Gaza Strip. More than half of all buildings in some areas damaged or completely destroyed. But the key thing to understand about this plan is it would make the West, make Gaza look much more like the occupied West Bank. Israel's military would ultimately have total security control, and the Palestinians would have some limited control over civilian issues. So that's hospitals, that's schools. But Tom, if you speak to folks in Gaza, they are not thinking about the future. They are trying to survive to the end of the day. As you said, there is sickness, disease spreading. Around half the population is at risk of starvation, according to the United Nations. And civilians are being killed every day in Israeli airstrikes. I sat down earlier today with the chief spokesman of the Israeli military, and I asked him about some data that shows that Israel has killed far more civilians and much faster than the U.S. did during the fight against ISIS in the Iraqi city of Mosul. I want you to take a listen to a little bit of that conversation. Are you showing less care than comparable militaries like the United yeah, States? The answer I think we're showing, in comparison, the, the most modern way to distinguish between civilians and terrorists, more than any other modern country in the world. I also asked him, how is it that three months into this war, the Israeli military has only rescued one hostage alive from Gaza? He said these rescue operations are unbelievably complex, and in some situations, they've actually had intelligence about where hostages are and decided not to launch the missions because they were afraid it would end in the deaths of those hostages. Tom. So, Raf, spelling out what we've talked about then, the plan for Gaza and what's going to be happening for the next few weeks and months, is there any realistic chance of diplomacy with Antony Blinken right now in the Middle East? So, Tom, he is arriving in a region where there are fires just everywhere you look, from yeah. Iran, where there was those twin bombings, to Iraq, the U.S. carrying out this drone strike. One of the key concerns is Lebanon. Hezbollah, the powerful Lebanese militant group, is saying it is going to retaliate for an Israeli strike earlier this week, which killed a senior member of Hamas. Israel's military says they are at peak readiness. Secretary of State trying to do what he can to defuse those tensions. Another key issue is Yemen, where you've had the Houthi rebels firing missiles at civilian shipping vessels in the Red Sea. The U.S. giving indications it may be moving towards strikes against the Houthis there. Tom. 
It's uh, bubbling up everywhere. Uh, Raf, thank you very much. Great work there in Tel Aviv. Coming up from us, another batch of documents in the Jeffrey Epstein case out today. Well, we know about who might be named in the docs. Plus, the FDA is approving a program in one state that could potentially save people just a ton of money on prescription meds. We're going to explain all of that in our five things. It's been a day of breaking news. A better than expected report this morning could spell good news for Main Street on the economy, but maybe not for Wall Street. Here's why. The new jobs numbers show the U.S. labor market is holding on strong. With the pace of hiring more powerful than experts thought it would be and the unemployment rate staying at a near record low. We want to bring in Caleb Silver now from Investopedia to help break all of this down. All right, Caleb, talk about what this jobs report really tells us because it's a bit of a mixed bag, right? Recession fears are fading, but the battle against inflation is still on. Yeah, the jobs report coming in much stronger than expected. We were only expecting somewhere between 160 and 170,000 job gains last month. We got that 216,000 number, the unemployment rate, holding steady. But the one number that we're paying a lot of attention to, Tom, is wage gains. Those were up 4.1 percent yeah. year over year, 15 cents just in the last month. The Federal Reserve has been trying to cool wage gains because those put pressure on companies and they ended up laying off workers and that's a concern but the hiring has been strong throughout 2023 fading a little bit in the last few months we had revisions downward for october and september you know i think you just made a great point because wage gains would seem to be great news for main street right because people get paid more the trouble is that adds to inflation and therefore may not be good for news for wall street and the question is will the fed feel compelled therefore to keep interest rates high for some time because you have this cycle of inflation and as you know there's been a lot of speculation the fed would cut rates in the new year and that seems to be off the burner at least for now yeah, I think a lot of investors were hoping the Fed was going to cut rates sooner rather than later in 2024, maybe as soon as the March meeting. That may be off the table because we still have a very strong labor market and strong wage gains. We have wage gains now over the rate of inflation, which is now below 3 percent. So that's good for consumers, bad for Wall Street because investors were hoping the Fed would get to those rate cuts sooner. That's been what's juicing stocks for the last couple of months. We saw a big sell off this week because now that timeline for those rate yeah. cuts may be pushed way out. And, you know, a lot of people, it just doesn't stick with them that the unemployment rate is so low because they see the inflation at the grocery store. Caleb, thank you. We really, really appreciate your expertise. Caleb Silver. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you may want to know about tonight. Number one, the U.S. and Ukraine say Russia is firing missiles obtained from North Korea into Ukraine as Russia continues its air bombardment. National Security spokesperson John Kirby's call calls it rather a significant and concerning escalation in North Korea's support for Russia. U.S. officials think North Korea wants military and space aid in return. Number two, actor Christian Oliver and his two young daughters are feared dead after a plane crash in the Caribbean. You may remember him from movies like Speed Racer and The Good German. Police say Oliver was on board the small plane when it went down in the ocean. Four bodies were recovered, presumably his, his daughters, and the pilots. Postmortems will officially determine determine the cause of death. Number three, coming up on the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, former Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn is launching his campaign for Congress. Dunn has testified about how scared and angry he was on January 6th and says running for office from Maryland gives him more of a voice, stating that his campaign platform is about democracy. Number four, a huge announcement from the FDA today saying Florida can import prescription drugs from Canada. This could be precedent setting. If it works, it could save people a lot of money on meds. The pharmaceutical industry has lobbied against this for years, saying it could put people at risk of getting counterfeit drugs. The FDA is approving Florida's program for two years as it determines whether Floridians save significant amounts of money and whether the drugs from Canada are in fact safe. And number five, the CDC says a multi-state salmonella outbreak is linked to this particular 
meat, uh, charcuterie. J just in this last week, more than 10,000 pounds of Busetto Foods ready to eat charcuterie meat. Products were recalled. The CDC says 24 people became sick, five had to be hospitalized. The agency advising to check your fridge for any recalled products. When we come back, a massive fire burning in warehouses from the 1800s. What's inside those warehouses that may have fueled the flames? Stay with us. And we have more breaking news just in now. A judge sentenced a former Colorado police officer convicted in the killing of Elijah McClain. A Randy Rodima was sentenced to 14 months in jail. A jury found Rodima guilty of criminally negligent homicide and third degree assault. Now, McLean, you may recall, 23 years old, was walking home in the Denver suburb of Aurora over four years ago when police stopped him. He was wearing a ski mask and he allegedly looked suspicious. Two more batches of newly unsealed court documents have been released today. In another story we're following closely, they are related to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. A total of more than 70 exhibits and more than 1,000 pages of documents made public for the first time, including the transcript of an interview with one of Epstein's housekeepers who testifies that he met Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, and Prince Andrew. They are being released as part of a lawsuit against Jelaine Maxwell, Epstein's longtime accomplice. Our NBC team has been combing through the documents for days now. Let's bring in Tom, Tom Winter. And Tom, what are we learning from this third and fourth batch of documents? Right, Tom. So we're up to 2,300 or so pages of documents that we now have and been going through. As we reported last night and previously, some of these things are items that we've seen before. Some names are names that we've seen before, either through our coverage of the various civil proceedings or the criminal proceeding against Maxwell, who you referenced earlier. Uh, but today we do have uh, some depositions that have been previously unreleased, including that one that you alluded to with Juan Alessi. And we're looking at it right now. This is he's kind of the former housekeeper, the person who ran uh, Epstein's uh, household in West Palm Beach and uh, arranged for groceries and things like that. And so he obviously is here talking about the former president uh, coming over to the house, actually uh, having meals, eating in the the kitchen with him, but importantly, I think he says that he never witnessed Trump uh, going to have a massage there. There's no allegation that the former president uh, has done anything illegal here. And of course, he's not the only former president who's been linked to Epstein. Bill Clinton uh, flying a number of times on Epstein's private jet. And of course, Maxwell, who we've referenced earlier, went to Chelsea Clinton's wedding. Uh, all told here, Tom, not expecting any more documents to be released today or over the weekend, uh, but certainly several more documents or several more uh, batches, I should say, of documents expected to be released next week. We will continue to follow that and see what additional information we can glean going forward. And there is this wide expectation that those still unreleased documents may have the names of people, high profile people linked to Epstein, right? Well, there is that, although we Right now, we haven't found, we found new names, Tom, but we haven't found anybody linked to any sort of criminal or illegal activity or anything that could raise questions as far as further avenues for civil lawsuits or further avenues for, frankly, investigative reporters to dig into. So, yes, Epstein definitely tied to uh, a number of high-profile individuals, but how deep those ties went right now doesn't appear to be much further than below, you know, than the, than the top of the surface, uh, but we'll just have to continue and wait and see what these documents show show us. Okay, Tom Winter, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and because it's tough to read, to watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have selected a few highlights for you. This is what they say is going down uh, in their regions. The segment is called The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, firefighters are battling a massive fire that's taken over a New Jersey industrial park. Look at that. The city's mayor says at least three warehouses caught on fire. Investigators think plastics burning inside the buildings need Near Elizabeth, New Jersey, are contributing to the smoke. The cause is still under investigation. Nobody injured. Out of our Southern Bureau, a man is suing Dunkin', Dunkin' Donuts, claiming he was hurt by an exploding toilet at one of the chain's Florida locations. 
He claims he suffered, quote, severe and long-term injuries, and he wants over $100,000. He also says he was covered in human feces, urine, and debris. Duncan has not responded to NBC's request for comment about the exploding toilet. And from our Northeast Bureau, this dog had a huge appetite for cash. Uh, a Pittsburgh couple, couple, a couple rather, left an envelope of money on their counter. And then their seven-year-old golden Dougal named Cecil decided he wanted to eat this very expensive treat, $4,000 worth to be exact. His owner spent the next few days really sifting through his waist, finding as much of the money as they could, piecing it all together, and how could you be upset with a face like that? You can't. Coming up, the super fast rise in the popularity of some weight loss drugs, really raising questions about their possible psychiatric side effects, what one major study is finding, and some names mentioned. We'll have that when we come back. It's a busy Friday. More breaking news just into us at this hour. We are just learning that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been in the hospital since New Year's Day. Here's what we know right now. Austin was admitted to Walter Reed National Medical Center for complications after a recent elective medical procedure. We don't know what. He is recovering and expected to resume his full duties today. That according to the Pentagon. A major new study out today shows that the main ingredient in popular weight loss drugs, Wegovy and Ozempic, significantly lower the risk of suicidal thoughts compared to other weight loss medications. Researchers found patients who took products with semaglutide were as much as 73% less likely to report suicidal thoughts than patients who were taking other weight loss drugs for diabetes or, or, or the like. The study was conducted because that ingredient, semaglutide, is being looked at as a potential treatment for drug addiction. NBC's Erica Edwards is joining us now. Erica, this generally looks like it's good news, but there could be some confusion here because, as we reported yesterday, the FDA is looking at potential, into potential side effects, right, of Ozempic and Wagovi, including suicidal thoughts. So how does this report match up with the FDA investigation? Yeah, very well, actually. It's important for the FDA to look into any possible uh, reports of suicidal ideation linked to these drugs that are widely popular. The issue finding its own investigation. But, and, you know, the FDA is also looking into other rare but possible side effects of the drugs linked to uh, nausea, vomiting, and other stomach ailments. Tom? You know, Erica, I heard a high profile doctor on the radio just yesterday saying uh, that he's not convinced yet of what side effects we don't know about down the road. And therefore, he's not uh, optimistic, or at least at this moment, he's not prescribing these meds despite the fact that, you know, this has been, these are being pretty widely uh, given out. You know, that's not what I've heard from the doctors I spoke with. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of times these patients, they say, go on these drugs. They work so well so fast that mood is generally lifted, um, at least in the short term. And that's why longer studies are certainly going to be needed, because a lot of these patients will need to be on them for years. And that's why it's so crucial to have additional studies ongoing. This is not the final say. Okay, and to that point, semaglutide, as we mentioned, is being considered as a treatment for drug addiction and not because it's, it's popular, it's a popular weight loss med, right? Well, yeah, you know, this study was actually actually came from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. As you mentioned, semaglutide is also being investigated as a potential drug to treat addiction. Now, that's a group already vulnerable to mental health uh, issues, and that's why researchers want to know right up front if there's any possible, any true link between uh, these drugs and suicidal thoughts. Uh, Erica, thank you very much. You've been on top of the story for some time, and it certainly is uh, captivating the country's attention. Erica Edwards, we appreciate it. That is a wrap for this hour. Coverage resumes on NBC News Now, right now.
Good day, and as we come on the air, this big Supreme Court announcement. It is making a huge decision and a huge step, agreeing to hear a case that could decide whether former President Trump can run for federal office again. We will be looking at the potentially seismic impact on the presidential election. And millions of people getting ready for the first big freeze of the season for them. They're bracing for cold and snow and rain, all of it, as a potential powerful winter storm gets ready to slam the Northeast. East. Will you need your shovel? We're going to look into that. And then the stunning resignation of the pro-gun movement's decades-long leader, why Wayne LaPierre chose today to step down from the NRA. Overseas, the Secretary of State touring the Middle East on edge. We're looking at if his diplomatic efforts can keep the Israeli-Hamas war from widening. Then another batch of documents dropping from the Jeffrey Epstein case. Our investigative team is sorting through more than a thousand pages of records. We will bring you the latest on that. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halley. We have a lot happening tonight. We begin with some breaking news just into us. The Supreme Court now agreeing to wait whether former President Donald Trump can be kicked off the Colorado ballot. This could have a massive impact on the race for the White House. The justices will hear the case on February 8th, and they are indicating it will make a ruling, or they will make a ruling fast as the primary season starts to heat up. It comes as Mr. Trump is campaigning in Iowa right this very minute. There he is, and you can see already fundraising off the justices' decision that they will, in fact, take the case, asking for money to stay on the ballot after courts and officials in Colorado and also in Maine have moved to disqualify him from running there. We go now to NBC's Von Hilliard, who is at that Donald Trump campaign event uh, in Iowa. Von, the court, the Supreme Court, could potentially set guidelines. How could this determine uh, what other states do, and what do you expect to happen? Tom, it could very well have far-reaching impacts well beyond Colorado. It is hard to think of a circumstance in which the U.S. Supreme Court would allow states to essentially form a patchwork of their own determinations about whether Donald Trump, the leading Republican candidate for president, is eligible or not for the ballot here. Uh, at the same time, the Colorado Supreme Court, they justices ruled that he was disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the disqualification clause that says if somebody engaged in insurrection or aided or provided aid or comfort to somebody who engaged in insurrection, they must be disqualified. And what this evening the U.S. Supreme Court said was that they are going to hear this case and oral arguments are set for February 8th. And if, in fact, they were to affirm the U.S. Supreme Court's decision, there that ruling could come in a matter of days. It could come in weeks or months. But the timeline of this is important, Tom, because, of course, Iowa caucus, the reason we're here in Iowa today and Donald Trump is as well, is that Iowa caucus is just 10 days from now. And then the New Hampshire primary in February 8th, in fact, the day of those oral arguments is the Nevada caucus. Following that, the South Carolina primary, and then more states vote beyond there. Of course, for Republicans around the country, if the Supreme Court were to somehow uh, uh, determine that he was should be disqualified from a ballot around the country, then at that point, majority of the states around the country would still have yet to vote in the Republican primary process. But of course, this is high stakes here, and uh, and all of this is going to be unfolding in real time, and a lot of pressure on Trump's legal team here with just weeks until those oral arguments. Well, well, it's unfolding real time behind you right there. And you're right. Nevada 8th is the same day as the Nevada uh, caucus or primary. I'm not sure what they have there. You can correct me. Uh, talk me through, the, though, the rest of the, of the wire here, the rest of the timing for the Supreme Court to do anything and what other primaries might be affected. Right. In 10 days from now is when the legal teams for both the Colorado voters and Trump's legal teams will have to file their first briefs. And then there's going to be further dates in which they are uh, ordered to file replies to those initial briefs. Uh, but February 8th is going to be the oral arguments day. Then it's a matter. It could be days, weeks, months for them to make their determination. But uh, seeing as how, uh, uh, how immediate the Supreme Court made their decision to take this up and the speed, the expedited speed in which they are going to have these 
oral arguments, it's hard to fathom that they are going to take much time to make the ruling. Of course, the Republicans' national convention, when they formally nominate, the delegates go to that convention hall and formally nominate the Republican candidate for president. That is in the middle of July. And so you would mm -hmm. expect here uh, them to try to make this determination in short order. Of course, if they reject the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, Donald Trump will remain on the ballot around the country. And then it all comes down to the politics and to his performance in these key early states and then, of course, beyond. And we have seen the former president get a boost after some of his legal issues and challenges. Absolutely. If you go back to last March, when that first indictment was handed down to him out of New York, he only had about a 10 percentage point lead over Ron DeSantis at that time. But with each indictment that came and followed, his lead only expanded. And what yeah. we have heard from even voters here in this room that I was talking to before Donald Trump took the stage is that they feel like the prosecutors around the country are, and courts around the country, judges, are unfairly targeting Donald Trump, and they are more solidly in his corner because of these legal battles that he is waging. And while they may have thought of Ron DeSantis at one point, they are solidly in Donald Trump's corner now because they believe that Donald Trump is the man that should defend them and take on this system that they believe is rigged against him. Uh, Vaughn, you're going to end up with a constitutional law degree when you're done with this campaign. But thank you very much, Vaughn Hilliard, day who's with the president. <laughs> yep, with the former president there in Iowa. Right now, uh, more than 30 million people are under winter alerts as the Northeast braces for the first big winter storm of the season there. It's moving through the middle of the country and through Texas before it heads up the East Coast, where it looks like it'll be the biggest snowstorm to hit in nearly two years. Snow, rain, ice, strong winds. Folks are getting ready with salt for the roads and sidewalks, shovels, snow plows. But some cities, like here in Washington, D.C., uh, we might just end up with a big rainstorm, not much more. And it would not be much of a surprise. D.C., listen to this, has gone 719 days without a single day of at least an inch of snow. Philadelphia has gone 705 days. New York, 690. So everybody is watching. However, keep the snow boots and the umbrellas handy and ready because after this storm, another pretty powerful storm is likely to be taking aim at the country as well. We have meteorologist Bill Karen standing by with a forecast. First, though, George. Solis is in New Jersey watching the folks at the Home Depot getting their ready on, right, <laughs> George? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Earlier, people getting the snow melt. They were getting their scrapers, getting their shovels. Some of them sort of remembering that muscle memory of what it takes to shovel and scrape. Many not looking forward to it, of course, because, as you mentioned, it's been nearly two years since we've seen any significant snowfall in this region. Of course, as you mentioned, D.C., New York, the Philly area, not going to get that winter wonderland that some folks absolutely love this time of year. But, of course, we are waiting for that second storm to come this way. And this could just be a dry run to make sure those supplies are stocked up and your tools are working like those snow blowers. Always a good reminder to give them a good test run before a big snowstorm comes. Here at the Home Depot, some folks very excited for the snowstorm. Any kind of snow, any kind of weather that basically breaks the monotony of just the bitter cold that we've been seeing out here today. We caught up with some of the people shopping here at the store. Here's what they told us. I was thinking getting ready. You know, this is our first uh, year to shovel our own home, so I'm just getting prepared. I've lived here all my life, so if it didn't snow another day, it would be great. I'm content with whatever nature comes or brings. Yeah, that mom particularly happy for any snow because she says it's a family affair. They like to get on any hill they can find and do some of that sledding. Again, we may not necessarily be able to do that this weekend, but all eyes, of course, on that storm that's coming to see if that snowfall does indeed fall sometime next week, Tom. You know, I grew up out in the Rocky Mountain West. I've had enough snow in my life. I mean, I'm happy if it's rain, but <laughs> but uh, rain, and specifically freezing rain in the Northeast, is is really not a good scenario. Yeah, not at all. Of course, we know that even a little bit of snow, a little bit of that 
uh, water with the cold weather can obviously create a real big problem on the roadways, and that's something that crews are always treating for. You'll see that salt brine product on roadways. You see the snow plows moving that salt product to in position in areas where they know that uh, icing could be a problem. The other factor to consider is power outages. So you've seen state officials across the Northeast, across the Mid-Atlantic, saying we have our crews in place, we have all the resources ready to go for whatever this storm might bring and whatever any storm may bring, frankly, because we know obviously it could create Create a lot of hazards yeah. on the roadways. Of course, airport delays are always a consideration when you have a storm system like this. So again, if nothing else, this is a good dry run for what is to come. And as yep. you mentioned, some folks hoping that whatever this is, hopefully will be it for the season. But we'll leave the rest of the science to our good friend, Bill Karens, right? <laughs> well, you set him up perfectly. Thank you, George. George Solis. Let's go to the aforementioned <laughs> Bill Karens, who has a meteorological degree right behind his name. All right, buddy, talk us through this. Is it going to be a boom or bust? Uh, some areas are going to get a little more than they thought, it's co you know, compared to a couple days ago. Other areas like the I-95 corridor that were hopeful. Yeah, for you, it's just, you know, big, tall rain boots and umbrella day tomorrow. So the storm is now. This is storm one. This is going to get confusing. We have three big storms in the next eight days. So we'll this, call this one storm one. This is mostly a rain event. We've had some snow. Wichita got about two inches. Albuquerque got three inches. There has been some snow reported from St. Louis southwards into Missouri, but nothing huge. Winter storm warnings. This is mostly going to be ice concerns in the mountains of Virginia, then this is just all snow, interior New England, where by this time in the winter, it shouldn't even be a big deal to get six inches of snow, but we haven't had any storms, so that's why this one's getting so much attention. And so there's the zero to one inch. I'm keeping the one inch there, just to you know, keep the kids hopeful. I mean, we got kids out there that haven't been sledding in three years. Uh, so from D.C., Philly to New York, you know, cross your fingers and hope, but it doesn't look good. And then north of you, that's where we're going to get into the issues. Ha, end up for plowing in Pennsylvania, all, almost all of upstate New York, and then the Hartford area. The mountainous areas who has the best chance of getting that foot of snow. So here's kind of the timing tracking the storm. So as we go throughout tonight, the storm really speeds up. There is the freezing rain tomorrow morning. There's the snow breaking out tomorrow afternoon. So by 6 p.m., D.C. is done tomorrow. I mean, it's going to be in and it's going to be out. Philadelphia rain will be ending probably about 8 to 10 p.m. New York City will be into it during the afternoon and then it will head out of here. And as far as northern New England goes, that's going to take a little bit longer. That's going to last through about midday Sunday with hit and miss rain. Boston may not be till sunset Sunday that you're finally done with that, Tom. Uh, you know, all the kids are going to turn their PJs inside out, just That's hoping right. hoping that they get enough, right, to, uh, to yeah. delay school on, for, on Monday. But we do have another storm coming next week. Yeah, storm number two is much bigger and going to cause a lot more problems than storm number one. So, storm two, into the Pacific Northwest as we go throughout your Saturday. Heavy snow throughout the Sierra and the Cascades, heading into the Wasatch Range, the Four Corner region on Sunday. And then the storm on Monday heads out into the middle of the country. This is when it really increases in intensity. This is going to be a big, huge wind machine. The blue shows you where the snow is, possible blizzard conditions somewhere not far from St. Louis to Chicago. And then heavy rain and maybe even severe thunderstorms as we go through Monday. Monday and Tuesday, and this heavy rain threat, very problematic on the East Coast. Along with it, mm. coastal winds could be 50 to 70 miles per hour. It's to be very similar to that huge, horrible flooding event that we had in the warm air about three, two, three weeks ago for areas of the East Coast. So here's our severe weather threat. This is Monday, Houston, New Orleans, Panama City. And then on Tuesday, Florida from Tampa, Orlando, northwards up through areas of North Carolina, a few strong tornadoes are possible. And then the flood threat map, Almost the same areas on Monday as the severe weather, but this little, this gets my attention, Tom. My house is located right in here. Already a moderate risk of severe flooding in northern New Jersey five days in advance. That's a bad sign. I know where you live. I used to live just a few That's blocks right. away. All right, buddy. Yeah, a lot be of good. little rivers that cause a lot of problems. Yep, they there sure are. Have a good weekend. Thank yep. you, Bill. Breaking news in just the last hour. A judge sentenced a former Colorado police officer convicted in the killing of Elijah McClain to more than a year in jail. Uh, that his name, rather, is Randy Rodima, found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and third-degree assault. 23-year-old McClain was walking home in Aurora, Colorado in 2019 when police stopped him for wearing a ski mask and, they say, allegedly looking suspicious. He was eventually wrestled to the ground, handcuffed, and injected with a sedative ketamine by a responding paramedic. An autopsy said he died at the hospital from ketamine toxicity. And we see Steve Patterson covering this story. Steve, walk us through now the sentencing. What else do we know? 
Yeah, the exact the exact jail sentence here, Tom, is 14 months in a county jail with work release and four years of probation. But keep in mind that probation runs concurrently with the jail sentence. We were watching for any reaction from Rodima while he was in court. There were cameras allowed in court. He was stoic as the sentencing was being read. The mother of Elijah McLean was not, though, visibly shaken, shaking her head, upset that more jail time wasn't allotted for this. The, obviously, the, the, the prosecution and the, the state was pushing for the maximum, which would have been three years. The defense wanted it just probation, no jail time. The judge came down somewhere in the middle. The mother, reading a statement, again, visibly upset after the sentencing was read, she said, quote, this is not justice, this is not accountability, this is just a slap on the wrist. Keep in mind, this case took place in 2019. Elijah McClain was walking home from a store. He had had done nothing wrong. He had no criminal background. He was not doing anything that amounted to criminal activity. He was simply wearing a ski mask, and the call came in for a suspicious character pinned on the ground, put in that carotid chokehold, which is now not part of the police manual as it was when this happened, and injected with enough ketamine to subdue a 200 pound person. Elijah McLean weighed 143 pounds. So this ignited, again, reigniting the debate about about police accountability, about safe police practices, and about racial justice following the George Floyd case. Uh, meanwhile, we did get a statement now from the Attorney General of Colorado, Phil Weiser, says, we believe the time in county jail and community service is appropriate and a serious sentence for Randy Rodima, who, as the judge noted, showed shocking indifference to the life of Elijah McClain. Tom? Uh, and we have those two paramedics who are still facing sentencing, right? Because they're the ones who gave him the ketamine. They are. Just to break this down again, there were five first responders who were charged. Uh, three police officers, of course, Randy Rodima, the only one that was found guilty. And then two paramedics were found guilty of the exact same thing, essentially, that Rodima was charged with. Their sentencing will be in just a few months. Tom? Uh, Steve, thank you. We appreciate it. Steve Patterson. Uh, we are just now learning in just the last few minutes the name of the sixth grader who was shot and killed at that high school in Iowa. We're also hearing that seven people total were injured. That's two more people than we were told originally by police. Police say the suspected shooter was a 17-year-old student, and he died by suicide. Classes are canceled for all high school students where the shooting actually happened next week. Let's bring in NBC's Adrian Bradas, who is in Perry, Iowa. Adrian, uh, what else do we know about this sixth grader who was killed? I hear you just spoke with a family friend. Tom, yes, that sixth grader is Amir Joluff. That's who died at the hands of this 17-year-old. He was 11 years old, and an aut aut autopsy revealed he had multiple gunshot wounds, at least three. Now, that family friend who we just spoke with say he was the sweetest kid. He was known in his neighborhood as the one to look out for the younger students, and he would often go around in the summertime sprucing up the area by picking up the trash. As you mentioned, we learned there were additional victims, at least two more compared to those initial reports, bringing the total number to seven. Three people remain in the hospital, including the principal of Perry High School, Dan Marburger. Here's what people say about him. Mr. Marburger, he was a hero. And I, and I know that it helped. The way that he approached that situation uh, and it saved some lives. And that was the district superintendent that you heard from there. He also told us that there will be no class for students next week at the high school for certain. Mm -hmm. He says he does not want the students to return until the high school looks how it looked before this tragic event happened. Tom? Adrian, help us understand very quickly, if I'm not mistaken, the sixth grader was at the high school early in the morning for breakfast. Is that right? Because it serves as kind of the cafeteria for several schools. Right. There were varying age groups in that cafeteria and the middle school and the high school are connected. And I do want to point out that there will be grab and go lunches next week for students. You can pick those up at the middle school. The superintendent mm. saying that the middle school was untouched. It's still intact. 
A lot of those kids still need uh, help. Adrian, thank you very much. Uh, now to more breaking news on the National Rifle Association, the NRA. The juggernaut gun rights lobbying group, just in the last few hours, we've heard that Wayne LaPierre has announced he is resigning. After more than 30 years leading the NRA, he cites health reasons. And that's big, because for years, LaPierre has been the face of the pro-gun movement and among the most influential conservative voices across the country. But the timing of this resignation is interesting because just days from now, LaPierre is set to face a civil trial in New York City. New York Attorney General Letitia James alleging that during his reign, LaPierre misspent millions of NRA funds and on things like personal vacations and expensive designer clothes. A.G. James reacted to the news today on X, writing in part, LaPierre's resignation validates our claims against him, but it will not insulate him from accountability. We look forward to presenting our case in court. NBC's Kendall Lanian picks up the story. It was once one of the most powerful political organizations in America, harnessing the voices of major celebrities. From my cold, dead hands. And striking fear in the hearts of elected officials. Gun-hating politicians should never go to bed unafraid of what this association and all of our millions of members can do to their political careers. But after decades of wielding outsized influence over the issue of gun control, the National Rifle Association is now facing the biggest crisis in its history, with membership and fundraising in steep decline. The man at the helm of the NRA for more than three decades, Wayne LaPierre, announcing he'll step down effective January 31st, citing health reasons. It comes just as a civil corruption trial is set to begin. New York's Attorney General Letitia James is suing, alleging LaPierre and others misspent the group's money on inflated pay, luxury travel, and designer suits. They use millions upon millions of dollars from the NRA for personal use, including for lavish trips for themselves and their families. The case alleges LaPierre billed the NRA over a half million dollars for eight family private jet trips to the Bahamas. Leaked internal documents posted on the Internet and reported by the Wall Street Journal show he billed another $40,000 for a single shopping trip to a Zania boutique in Beverly Hills. A judge denied the AG's bid to dissolve the NRA entirely, so any money recovered would flow back to the group, which says it has cleaned up its financial affairs. Both the NRA and LaPierre did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. But LaPierre said in a 2020 statement that the AG's investigation is an affront to democracy and freedom, calling it an unconstitutional premeditated attack aiming to destroy the NRA. The NRA has got to go! Hey, hey! James, a Democrat vocal in America's partisan gun debate. Tell those cowardly Congress members, members of the GOP, that you'll feel the pressure. You'll feel the pressure. The legal fight and bad publicity have apparently hurt the NRA. For a very long time, the NRA was the single loudest voice on gun policy in the country. Nobody sees the NRA as some invincible juggernaut anymore. Instead, it's an organization who you might not want to be uh, associated with too much in public. According to the New York Times, membership has shrunk to just over 4 million, down from what the NRA reported was 6 million five years ago. And membership dues down, too, by $14 million from 2021 to 2022, according to an audit filed as part of the suit. It all comes on the heels of growing troubles for the organization. Text reject. R-E-J. Outrage e following mass shootings led to a series of celebrity campaigns to reject the NRA. Hi, my name is Jack Antonoff. Cheryl Crow. Melissa McCarthy. Anna DeVere Smith. Adam Scott. And more criticism after then-spokesperson Dana Lash accused the media of loving mass shootings. Crying white mothers are ratings gold. The NRA soon finding itself the target of a boycott, with major companies including Delta, MetLife, and Hertz cutting ties. But the NRA's decline hasn't changed the politics of gun control, as mass shootings continue to rock communities across the country. Active shooter incidents, all available units to listen. I've never been so scared in my life. Major gun restrictions, such as a ban on assault weapons, have proven impossible to enact. 
while an American's right to bear arms almost without restriction has become Republican Party gospel. I was proud to be the most pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment president you've ever had. Now, as the NRA trial looms, onlookers wondering if it will galvanize support or mark the beginning of a new chapter in America's gun debate. Ken Delanian, NBC News, Washington. So, Danny, can it officially, effectively rather, distance itself from LaPierre now that he's out? And does his resignation indicate anything about the legal jeopardy that he could be in and that, in fact, the uh, organization recognizes it's been in in terms of its finances? Well, understanding a bit of the history here, originally Letitia James sought not only to get LaPierre and others out of their supervisor, their official roles within the NRA, she also sought to dissolve the NRA. A judge denied that bid and instead allowed the claims to proceed forward and seek restitution. Not restitution to the attorney general or the state of New York, but restitution back to the organization itself. So while the attorney general originally wanted to dissolve the NRA completely, the court made her settle for getting rid of LaPierre. That has now happened. So a major goal of the lawsuit has been achieved. To the extent that LaPierre may face additional liability, that remains to be seen. But you have to imagine that law enforcement, if they were interested in him for any reason based on the private jets and the shopping sprees, they likely would have indicted him already. However, anything is possible. Investigations often take a long time. So who knows? But in terms of legal jeopardy, LaPierre was already in legal jeopardy in this case as one of the people targeted by Letitia James. Yeah. Uh, okay, don't go anywhere. Something's going to break in a few minutes. We're sure of it. Uh, Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Back soon. All right, let's take you overseas now where uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on a diplomatic tour of the Middle East, trying to tamp down rising tensions in that region as top Israeli leaders are now publishing plans for what could be next in the war and then what comes after that. That includes a proposal that neither Israel nor Hamas will be in control of Gaza after the war. Those top Israeli leaders say local, non-hostile actors would govern the Strip. According to their plan, the United States States would lead a multinational task force to rebuild Gaza. What precisely that looks like is not very clear at this point. For now, Israeli, uh, Israeli leaders say the next phase of the war will involve raids and special operations in northern Gaza and a focus on eliminating Hamas leadership in the south. As we're learning more about the absolute devastation for civilians in the Strip, with the United Nations revealing cases of diarrhea for young children up 50 percent in just one week and 90 percent of babies under the age of two now facing severe food poverty. Let's go to NBC's Raf Sanchez, who's on the ground in Tel Aviv. Raf, th those are really startling numbers. As you know, babies get dehydrated in a heartbeat. Uh, what more do we know about Israel's new plan for Gaza? And importantly, what could it mean for the people who live there? Well, Tom, it's very interesting. Just one day before Secretary of State Blinken arrived back here in the Middle East, Israel starting to lay out a vision for Gaza post Hamas. As you said, there are a number of components here. They are looking for the U.S. and for wealthy Arab states to pay for the reconstruction of the frankly devastated Gaza Strip. More than half of all buildings in some areas damaged or completely destroyed. But the key thing you understand about this plan is it would make the West, make Gaza look much more like the occupied West Bank. Israel's military would ultimately have total security control, and the Palestinians would have some limited control over civilian issues. So that's hospitals, that's schools. But Tom, if you speak to folks in Gaza, they are not thinking about the future. They are trying to survive to the end of the day. As you said, there is sickness, disease spreading. Around half the population is at risk of starvation, according to the United Nations, and civilians are being killed every day in Israeli airstrikes. I sat down earlier today with the chief spokesman of the Israeli military, and I asked him about some data that shows that Israel has killed far more civilians and much faster than the U.S. did during the fight against ISIS in the Iraqi city of Mosul. I want you to take a listen to a little bit of that conversation. Are you showing less care than comparable militaries like the United yeah, States? The answer I think we're showing, in comparison, the, the most modern way 
to distinguish between civilians and terrorists more than any other modern country in the world. I also asked him, how is it that three months into this war, the Israeli military has only rescued one hostage alive from Gaza? He said these rescue operations are unbelievably complex, and in some situations, they've actually had intelligence about where hostages are and decided not to launch the missions because they were afraid it would end in the deaths of those hostages. Tom. So, Raf, spelling out what we've talked about then, the plan for Gaza and what's going to be happening for the next few weeks and months, is there any realistic chance of diplomacy with Antony Blinken right now in the Middle East? So, Tom, he is arriving in a region where there are fires just everywhere you look, from yeah. Iran, where there was those twin bombings, to Iraq, the U.S. carrying out this drone strike. One of the key concerns is Lebanon. Hezbollah, the powerful Lebanese militant group, is saying it is going to retaliate for an Israeli strike earlier this week, which killed a senior member of Hamas. Israel's military says they are at peak readiness. Secretary of State trying to do what he can to defuse those tensions. Another key issue issue is Yemen, where you've had the Houthi rebels firing missiles at civilian shipping vessels in the Red Sea, the U.S. giving indications it may be moving towards strikes against the Houthis there. Tom? It's uh, bubbling up everywhere. Uh, Raf, thank you very much. Great work there in Tel Aviv. Here at home, a better-than-expected jobs report this morning could spell good news for Main Street, but maybe not for Wall Street. Here's why. The new jobs numbers show the U.S. labor market is holding on strong with the pace of hiring, more powerful than experts thought it would be, and the, the unemployment rate staying uh, really at a pretty low level. Let's bring in Caleb Silver from Investopedia. All right, Caleb, talk about what this jobs report really tells us, because it's a bit of a mixed bag, right? Recession fears are fading, but the battle against inflation is still on. Yeah, the jobs report coming in much stronger than expected. We were only expecting somewhere between 160 and 170,000 job gains last month. We got that 216,000 number, the unemployment rate, holding steady. But the one number that we're paying a lot of attention to, Tom, is wage gains. Those were up 4.1 percent yeah. year over year, 15 cents just in the last month. The Federal Reserve has been trying to cool wage gains because those put pressure on companies and they ended up laying off workers and that's a concern but the hiring has been strong throughout 2023 fading a little bit in the last few months we had revisions downward for october and september you know i think you just made a great point because wage gains would seem to be great news for main street right because people get paid more the trouble is that adds to inflation and therefore may not be good for news for wall street and the question is will the fed feel compelled therefore to keep interest rates high for some time because you have this cycle of inflation and as you know there's been a lot of speculation the fed would cut rates in the new year and that seems to be off the burner at least for now yeah i think a lot of investors were hoping the Fed was going to cut rates sooner rather than later in 2024, maybe as soon as the March meeting. That may be off the table because we still have a very strong labor market and strong wage gains. We have wage gains now over the rate of inflation, which is now below 3 percent. So that's good for consumers, bad for Wall Street because investors were hoping the Fed would get to those rate cuts sooner. That's been what's juicing stocks for the last couple of months. We saw a big sell-off this week because now that timeline for those rate yeah. cuts may be pushed way out. And, you know, a lot of people, it just doesn't stick with them that the unemployment rate is so low because they see the inflation at the grocery store. Caleb, thank you. We really, really appreciate your expertise. Caleb Silver. Coming up from Moss, police say at least one person is dead after a tour bus rolled over in New York. Those new details coming up in our five things. Plus, some popular items like Pepsi and Doritos are going to get pulled from the shelves of a major global supermarket chain. We'll tell you why coming up later in the hour. We're back. Two more batches of newly unsealed court documents have been released today related to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. A total of more than 70 exhibits and more than a thousand pages of documents made public for the first time, including the transcript of an interview with one of Epstein's housekeepers who testifies that he met Donald Trump and Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew. They're being released as part of this lawsuit against Jelaine Maxwell, Epstein's longtime accomplice. Our NBC team has been combing through the documents. NBC's Tom Winter joining us now. 
And Tom, what are we learning from this third and fourth batch of documents? Right, Tom. So we're up to 2,300 or so pages of documents that we now have and been going through. As we reported last night and previously, some of these things are items that we've seen before. Some names are names that we've seen before, either through our coverage of the various civil proceedings or the criminal proceeding against Maxwell, who you referenced earlier. Uh, but today we do have uh, some depositions that have been previously unreleased, including that one that you alluded to with Juan Alessi, and we're looking at it right now. This is He's kind of the former housekeeper, the person who ran uh, Epstein's uh, household in West Palm Beach and uh, arranged for groceries and things like that. And so he obviously is t here talking about the former president uh, coming over to the house, actually uh, having meals, eating in the kitchen with him. Uh, but importantly, I think he says that he never witnessed Trump uh, going to have a massage there. There's no allegation that the former president uh, has done anything illegal here. And of course, he's not the only former president who's been linked to Epstein. Bill Clinton uh, flying a number of times on Epstein's private jet. And of course, Maxwell, who we've referenced earlier, went to Chelsea Clinton's wedding. Uh, all told here, Tom, not expecting any more documents to be released today or over the weekend, uh, but certainly several more documents or several more uh, batches, I should say, of documents expected to be released next week. We will continue to follow that and see what additional information we can glean going forward. And there is this wide expectation that those still unreleased documents may have the names of people, high-profile people linked to Epstein, right? Well, there is that, although we, right now we haven't found, we found new names, Tom, but we haven't found anybody linked to any sort of criminal or illegal activity or anything that could raise questions as far as further avenues for civil lawsuits or further avenues for, frankly, investigative reporters to dig into. So, yes, Epstein definitely tied to uh, a number of high-profile individuals, but how deep those ties went right now doesn't appear to be much further than below, you know, than the, than the top of the surface, uh, but we'll We'll just have to continue and wait and see what these documents show us. Okay, Tom Winter, thank you very much. Yeah. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you may want to know about tonight. Number one, we're learning just in the last hour or so that one person was killed after a tour bus rolled over on a highway in New York State. Police say about a dozen others are injured. The bus was coming from Montreal. State police are investigating what happened. Number two, New York's Attorney General Letitia James is asking for a $370 million fine against Donald Trump and his companies for the lifetime bans locked Mr. Trump out of his two former company and his two former company executives out of New York's uh, legal real estate industry. Defense lawyers say the evidence does not show the former president intended to defraud. Mr. Trump says he did nothing wrong. Number three, Tampa Bay Rays all-star shortstop Wander Franco released conditionally today in the Dominican Republic. He's being investigated for allegedly engaging in a relationship with a 14-year-old girl and giving the girl's mother payments and a car in exchange for her consent. He's accused of sexual exploitation and money laundering. The girl's mother faces the same charges. Number four, a huge announcement from the FDA today saying Florida can import prescription drugs from Canada. This could be precedent setting. If it works, it could save people a lot of money on meds. The pharmaceutical industry has lobbied against this for years, saying it could put people at risk for counterfeit drugs. The FDA is approving Florida's program for two years as it determines whether Floridians can save significant amounts of money and whether the drugs from Canada are in fact safe. And number five, coming up on the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, former Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn is launching his campaign for Congress. Dunn has testified about how scared and angry he was back on January 6th. He says running for office from Maryland gives him a more significant voice, stating that his campaign platform is about democracy. When we come back, an investigation tonight in Indonesia after two trains collided, killing at least four people there. What we're learning about the victims right after the break. We're back. Just in the last couple of hours, President Biden kicked off the presidential election year by turning his focus squarely on former President Trump, basically saying that his likely general election rival will dismantle democracy as we know it. Take a listen. The choice is clear. Donald Trump's campaign is about him, not America, not you. Donald Trump's campaign is obsessed with the past, not the future. 
He's willing to sacrifice our democracy. It is just the third public campaign event for the president since he announced his re-election bid more than eight months ago. Uh, coming just a day before the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, the timing and the location carefully choreographed. The speech happened near Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where George Washington and his army war fought the Revolutionary War and hunkered down during the war for American independence and democracy. NBC's Mike Memoli has more. <laughs> Well, Tom, since President Biden launched his re-election campaign in April, we've seen him traveling across the country doing a number of official events talking primarily about the economy. So today marked a really significant shift on the part of the president to talk about what he said would be the defining question in 2024, whether Americans will join him in standing up for the sacred cause that is democracy. President Biden using some of the most pointed terms we've heard, not just this year or the, the past year, but throughout the entire time he's been in office and talking about his predecessor, talking about what Donald Trump was responsible for, not just on January 6th, the anniversary of which the speech was timed to coincide with, but also the way in which he has denigrated our troops, which he has squandered our alliances across uh, the world, and also put the democracy itself at risk. The president really framing this as one question for voters. Let's take a listen to part of that remark. And our campaign is about preserving and strengthening our American democracy. We all know who Donald Trump is. The question we have to answer is, who are we? That's what's at stake. Who are we? Now, the president is going to continue this focus, especially focused on political violence when he travels to South Carolina on Monday for a speech at Mother Emanuel Church. That's where nine black worshipers were killed uh, by an avowed white supremacist. The president really ramping up this campaign as 2024 is underway. And we're also getting just this hour a first response from Donald Trump saying that the only reason Biden is at Valley Forge abusing George Washington's legacy to slander 75 million Americans is that he knows he can't show his face at the southern border or or in the auto workers factories in Michigan where he is destroying jobs. This is an indication that, yes, there are Republican voters heading to the polls in Iowa and across the country starting in 10 days, but already it looks like we're talking about a general election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, a rematch in 2024. Tom? Mike Memoli, thank you very much. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day, and it's awfully tough to read, watch, or listen to all of them. So our international teams have got a few highlights. Here's what they tell us they're watching. We call the segment The Global, out of Indonesia. At least four people are dead, dozens injured, after two trains collided on the main island of Java. The crash caused multiple train carriages to buckle and overturn. From South Africa, disgraced Olympic runner and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius released early from prison today on parole. He's been in prison for almost nine years for killing his girlfriend. Pistorius is expected to live in his uncle's mansion under strict parole conditions. Out of France, Belgium, Spain, and a lot of other countries, global supermarket chain Carrefour is going to stop selling PepsiCo products in some stores. We're talking things like Lay's potato chips, Lipton tea, and of course, Pepsi soda. Pepsi soda. Why? The company says they're simply way too expensive. Prices for some products have gone up double digits in the past few months. PepsiCo says it's been in talks with the supermarket chain and will keep trying to, quote, ensure that our products are available in those countries. Coming up from us, a major new study looking at those super popular weight loss drugs and their possible psychiatric side effects. It's a busy Friday. More breaking news just into us at this hour. We are just learning that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been in the hospital since New Year's Day. Here's what we know right now. Austin was admitted to Walter Reed National Medical Center for complications after a recent elective medical procedure. We don't know what. He is recovering and expected to resume his full duties today. That according to the Pentagon. A major new study out today shows that the main ingredient in popular weight loss drugs, Wegovi and Ozempic, significantly lower the risk of suicidal thoughts compared to other weight loss medications. Researchers found patients who took products with semaglutide were as much as 73% less likely to report suicidal thoughts than patients who were taking other weight loss drugs for diabetes or, or, or the like. The study was conducted because that ingredient 
semaglutide is being looked at as a potential treatment for drug addiction. NBC's Erica Edwards is joining us now. Erica, this generally looks like it's good news, but there could be some confusion here because as we reported yesterday, the FDA is looking at potential, into potential side effects, right, of Ozempic and Wagovi, including suicidal thoughts. So how does this report match up with the FDA investigation? Yeah, very well, actually. It's important for the FDA to look into any possible uh, reports of suicidal ideation linked to these drugs that are widely popular. The new finding its own investigation. But, you know, the FDA is also looking into other rare but possible side effects of the drugs linked to uh, nausea, vomiting, and other stomach ailments. Tom? You know, Erica, I heard a high-profile doctor on the radio just yesterday saying uh, that he's not convinced yet of what side effects we don't know about down the road. And therefore, he's not uh, optimistic, or at least at this moment, he's not prescribing these meds, despite the fact that, you know, this has been, these are being pretty widely uh, given out. You know, that's not what I heard from the doctors I spoke with. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of times these patients, they say, go on these drugs. They work so well so fast that mood is generally lifted, um, at least in the short term. And that's why longer studies are certainly going to be needed, because a lot of these patients will need to be on them for years. And that's why it's so crucial to have additional studies ongoing. This is not the final say. Okay, and to that point, semaglutide, as we mentioned, is being considered as a treatment for drug addiction and not because it's, it's popular, it's a popular weight loss med, right? Well, yeah, you know, this study was actually actually came from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. As you mentioned, semaglutide is also being investigated as a potential drug to treat addiction. Now, that's a group already vulnerable to mental health uh, issues, and that's why researchers want to know right up front if there's any possible, any true link between uh, these drugs and suicidal thoughts. Uh, Erica, thank you very much. You've been on top of the story for some time, and it certainly is uh, captivating the country's attention. Erica Edwards, we appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.